this video, we're going to cover how carbon forms four covalent bonds with other atoms, which leads to molecular diversity. We're going to break down hydrocarbons, isomers, and important chemical groups. Let's get started. Okay, there are four elements that account for approximately 90% of the total dry mass of chemical elements found in human cells. They are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And the most abundant element is carbon. Human life is based on carbon. This abundant element is extremely important in living organisms because carbon can combine with several other elements creating different molecules which contribute to the most important functions of the cell. Molecules that contain carbon are called organic molecules and the study of these organic compounds is called organic chemistry. So now let's subtract complexity and go through how carbon can form a wide variety of molecules. Okay. Briefly going back to the atom structure lecture, we covered how an atom's chemical characteristic and how they behave is determined by its electron configuration, specifically its valence electrons that determines this, because they are available to form bonds with other atoms to complete their valence shell or outermer shell. Atoms whose valence shell is complete, they are chemically unreactive, okay, because they are complete they are whole, they will not interact readily with other atoms. Now, carbon has six electrons. Two of those electrons occupy the first electron shell, and the first electron shell can only hold two electrons, okay? It has a capacity of two. So the other four electrons are in the second shell, and that gives us four valence electrons in the second shell. Recall that the second shell can hold up to eight electrons. For carbon to complete its second shell, its valence shell, it needs to share its four electrons so that eight electrons are available. Recall that the sharing of paired electrons is covalent bonding. And carbon usually forms a single or double covalent bonds, which is how carbon can form a wide variety of complex molecules. Let's go through an example using methane. So one carbon atom, combines with four atoms of hydrogen to form methane, which is a gas. So each of the four valence electrons of carbon shares an electron with one of the hydrogen atoms. The way the bonds form, these bonds can rotate freely. Carbon is in the middle and a 3D structure is formed called a tetrahedron. The molecular formula of methane is CH4. And the structural formula is drawn like this. And if we were to use a ball and stick model, it would look like this, forming a tetrahedral shape. Okay, let's now take a look at another example. Let's use carbon dioxide. A single carbon atom combines with two oxygen, okay, two atoms of oxygen by double covalent bonds. We can draw the structural formula like this. So each line represents a pair of shared electrons and both the carbon atom and the two oxygen atoms complete its valence shell. All right, so that's how carbon forms four covalent bonds with other atoms. Carbon can also link with other carbon atoms through covalent bonds, forming long chains or carbon skeletons, which leads to more structurally and functionally diverse molecules. Carbon chains or skeletons, they can vary in length, they can be branched, they can form double bonds, or they can link to form a ring. So now let's break down hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are organic molecules consisting of only carbon and hydrogen. With only these two atoms, we can form a wide variety of molecules. Hydrogen atoms are linked to the carbon skeleton wherever there is free electrons available to bond covalently. Hydrocarbons are major components of fossil fuel, but applying it to cells and living organisms, this is where fats come in. Fats have long hydrocarbon tails which are attached to a non-carbohydrate component. Hydrocarbon bonds are non-polar, so they are hydrophobic or water-fearing, so they don't dissolve in water. Non-polar 
that means that there are no regions of positive or negative charges, okay? So in a nonpolar covalent bond, it means that the electrons are shared almost equally, right? So those are hydrocarbons. Now there are molecules that have the same chemical formulas, same number of atoms of the same elements, but have different structures. And these are known as isomers. So let's go through and break down three types of isomers, structural, cis-trans, and enantiomers. Starting with structural, structural isomers define their arrangement of covalent bonding partners, so different structure, okay? They may also differ in the location of double bonds. Let's go through an example here, pentane and 2-methylbutane. These five carbon compounds both have the molecular formula of C5H12. But if we take a look at their structure, they are different in the covalent arrangements of their carbon skeleton. Pentane has a straight carbon skeleton, whereas this one here is branched. So structural isomers differ in their structure, okay? The second type of isomers is cis-trans isomers or geometric isomers. In this isomer, they differ in arrangement about a double bond. So the carbons have covalent bonds to the same atoms, but these atoms differ in their spatial arrangement. So here I have, okay, a simple molecule with two double bonded carbons. They have hydrogen atoms and X compound attached to it. The X here just represents an atom or a group of atoms attached to a double bonded carbon. If both the X's are on the same side, it's called a cis isomer. And if the X's are on opposite sides, it's a trans isomer, all right? So that's the second type. The third type of isomers are enantiomers. These isomers are mirror images of each other that differ in shape due to the presence of an asymmetric carbon, which is attached to four different atoms. And these atoms, or a group of atoms, can be arranged around the asymmetric carbon two di in two different ways that are mirror images. So think left-handed and right-handed versions of each other. These two isomers are either L or D isomers, from the Latin for left and right, levo and dextro. Enantiomers are crucial in the pharmaceutical industry because the two enantiomers of a drug may not be equally affected. So for example, let's take ibuprofen, which reduces inflammation and pain. So it has two enantiomers and one is an effective enantiomer and the other is ineffective. Okay, so those are isomers. We've covered so far how carbon can form four covalent bonds with other atoms, and it can link to other atoms, other carbon atoms, forming long chains or carbon skeletons. But the uniqueness of organic molecules doesn't only come from the arrangement of hydrocarbons, but also on the several chemical groups that are attached to the carbon chain. And these chemical groups are very important in biological processes, okay? Chemical groups that are involved in chemical reactions are known as functional groups. Each group has unique shape and has a unique shape and it can be directly involved in chemical reactions. So let's go through an example here. An example being the female and male sex hormones, estradiol, which is a type of estrogen, and testosterone. Both of these compounds are steroids, okay? They are organic molecules with a common carbon skeleton, four fused rings. So as you can see, they're exactly the same. The only difference between these two compounds are the chemical groups that are attached to the rings. And they both have different actions in the human body and other vertebrates, okay? They're involved in the development of sexual characteristics and contrasting features of male and female organisms. So, for example, estrogen stimulates breast growth, female body configuration development during puberty, and other effects as well, whereas testosterone stimulates muscle and bone growth, okay? So functional groups are extremely crucial in biological processes. So let's go through the seven important chemical groups. So first up is the hydroxyl group. This group is polar due to oxygen, which is electronegative, okay? Next up, carbonyl. The carbonyl group, if the carbonyl group is within a carbon skeleton, it's called a ketone. 
but if it's at the end of a carbon skeleton, it's called an aldehyde, all right? Key term, if it's within a carbon skeleton, and if it's in the end, aldehyde. The third group is carboxyl. This group acts as an acid, so it can donate a proton. Because of the polar covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen, this is also called a carboxylic acid or organic acid. Amino or amine, this acts as a base, so it can pick up hydrogen or protons from the surrounding solution. Sulfohydryl, we can call this a thiol group. Phosphate or organic phosphate, when it's attached to a molecule, it gives that molecule the ability to react with water and releases energy. An example being adenosine triphosphate or ATP, which is extremely important in cells. And methyl group, which I don't have here. The compound name is methylated compound, and this group affects the expression of genes when it's bonded to DNA or to a protein that bind to DNA. It affects the shape and function of male and female sex hormones. Okay, now the sixth group here that I have shown here can be chemically reactive. And all the six groups, except the thiol group, are hydrophilic. And so these group can increase the solubility of organic compounds in water. Okay, and that is carbon, which is an important element in life that can form structurally and functionally diverse molecules. In this lecture, we learned that carbon-containing compounds are organic molecules, and the study of these organic compounds is called organic chemistry. We covered how carbons can form four covalent bonds with other atoms, or it can link with other carbons, forming long chains that are straight, branch, or can link to form a ring. We also broke down the three types of isomers, structural, cis-trans, and enantiomers, and how functional groups can be attached to carbon skeletons and form molecules that are important and directly involved in biological processes. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating!